Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to this Resolution Foundation event. My name is David Willis. I'm president of the Resolution Foundation. Uh, and it also gives me great pleasure to be in Birmingham because I was brought up in Birmingham. And it is always great to be back. Uh, and what we're going to do this evening is we're going to have a serious conversation about the state of Birmingham and its economy. The screen is not going to change to show the football. <laughs> um, I'm sorry about that, but this is, you are hardcore people who are assembling to discuss this crucial subject even when there's just possibly a football match being played in 20-25 minutes. Um, we at Resolution are doing uh, an economic inquiry into Britain, the state of the British economy and how we can raise our game in partnership with the London School of Economics and funded by the Nuffield Foundation. Uh, but we're very aware that you can't just do this from London and we're very, very keen to properly take account of and consider the position in our, all the regions of the UK and in all of our major cities. So this is both an opportunity for us to present our interim kind of analysis, the result of the first year's work, but this second year that we're just embarking on is to turn that into detailed policy proposals. So what you say this evening will help us develop our policy ideas in ways that I hope are not just national, but are relevant for the challenges that Britain and particularly Birmingham faces. So you're going to hear first from Emily Fry, who is an economist at Resolution Foundation. We'll then hear from Deborah Cadman, of course, Chief Executive of the Birmingham Council, and then from Henriette Bravla, Chief Executive of the Greater Birmingham and the Soli Uh And ample time for you to put questions or just make comments and give suggestions to us, which we would greatly appreciate. So, Seth Paul Rowling, Emily, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, as David mentioned, uh, you'll see the interim report in front of you. Please take one for your friends or your colleagues. Um, we have several here. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about the West Midlands' role in the future of the UK economy. Um, so first up, we have to talk about the immediate challenge. We're facing some of the highest inflation uh, that we've seen over the past uh, several decades. It's now reached about 11.1%. And what's key about this inflation is that it's three percentage points higher for lower income people than for higher income people. It's really hitting people's pockets uh, bad at the moment. And the reason behind this increased inflation is because we're importing a lot of our, of our goods, in particular energy, which has caused about a third of this inflation. What this has done, this chart is showing that the OBR's disposable income forecast, this is fresh off the autumn budget from a couple of weeks ago, um, and if you focus on the red bars on the right hand side of this chart, you'll see the income falls this year and next that are anticipated because of these huge uh, increases in inflation. Um, and so that's going to amount to about a 7% decline in incomes over just two years. This is uh, historic levels, and you really wouldn't expect to see this and, unless it was a really bad recession. So the context is we are having a really challenging time. But if we look a little bit further back, this is coming off the back of about 15 years of relative economic decline. We have inherited high inequality from the 1980s. Uh, this is showing the Gini coefficient, which is one measure of inequality that you can see. Um, it rose uh, quite rapidly over the 1980s and then has stayed relatively static since then. Um, there are several uh, measures that you can use for inequality. They all show a relatively same thing for the UK. Um, and now we are the most unequal large country in Europe. But the worries about inequality have, didn't really exist in the 1980s. That's a recent phenomenon over the past 10 years or so. And you can see that this is, you can see why this is if you look at the disposable income per capita on this chart, so the green line, um, which was growing very quickly up until the financial crisis and then has declined uh, in terms of growth since then. 
And while some people might say that aggregate economic progress doesn't matter, um, you can see that our wage, uh, our, the lack of wage growth over the last 15 years has really been because of this lack of GDP growth. So it's been this combination that has led to people not achieving wage growth. So what's the problem for modern Britain? High inequality and low growth. It's a toxic combination. If you look at this chart, you can see in red are the poorest people in uh, countries around Europe, in green are the highest income people, the richest people, and then the blue bars show the, the middle income people. And what you can see is in different European countries, so France, which is similarly quite similar to our economy, the lowest income people have much higher incomes uh, than they do in the UK, so they're, they're about 30% higher. Um, the people in the UK, whereas the richest people have slightly lower incomes. You can see for countries like Germany, the richest people are also richer, um, and the, the poorest people are much richer as well uh, than they are in the UK. On the other side of things, you've got Italy and Spain, where uh, the richest people are poorer, so are the poorest people. And so it's got lower inequality, but also uh, much lower GDP per capita. The combination of the two isn't great either but we want low inequality, high growth. It's wiped out high households' ability to absorb shocks. So if you look at the top uh, bar here, that's the lowest um, income people in the UK. In 2006, they were spending about 52% of their disposable income on essentials, that's things like food, energy. That's risen to about 59% in 2019. And with uh, the energy crisis and with inflation, that's looking like it's gonna be rising farther this year. So rebooting Britain, it means getting serious about growth. First up, services is an enduring strength for the UK. We are the largest economy. You can see us on the right-hand side in the blue uh, bar here to be specialised in services, and it has been consistent over the last uh, several decades. So whilst manufacturing has maintained a prominent role in the Birmingham economy, um, it's about 15% of gross value added, our measure of output in Birmingham. Uh, Public admin and health are 25% of Birmingham's economy, and finance is 21% of Birmingham's economy. So you can see that other sectors are also really important. This is looking at the, the performance of our second cities. Most people live in cities in the UK. Um, you, you can see about 70% of people, but most of our major cities in the UK really lag in terms of productivity. This is showing you the productivity um, across various metro regions, uh, with the size of the bubble representing the size of that region. And so you can see for the West Midlands urban area, we'd have to increase productivity by 50% to be about the same level as London. Obviously, we have specific specialisms, as I mentioned, we're a services economy, but it's far from inevitable. If you look at France, for example, which again is a similar uh, service specialised economy, Paris has much higher productivity, but the inequality is really lessened by the fact that uh, Lyon, Toulouse, some of their major second cities, also have relatively high productivity if you compare it to the UK. Germany has very distributed uh, productivity That's a, 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 because they're a manufacturing economy. Um, we're not saying we have to be like Germany, but we are saying let's see a better version of the UK. So just to take you through a very quick thought experiment, what do we need to increase these productivity gaps in the West Midlands? We need three things. We need to increase capital per worker, things like physical capital, also things like intangibles, which include um, IT equipment, for example, and R&D. We need to increase that by 33%. We need to increase the graduate share. There's some world-leading universities in the West Midlands, um, but unfortunately, people are, graduates are leaving. We need that to increase to about 39% from 30% today. And we also need total employment increase um, across uh, the West Midlands which um, is a challenge because West Midlands has lagged uh, the UK averages in terms of employment levels for the last several years. We also need to focus on the changes that matter. Uh, when, when the West Midlands is highlighted in green here, um, but you can see that Brexit has caused a redu reduction, a permanent reduction in our real wages. Um, and our annual pay. So there's about £500 reduction uh, per worker per year uh, because of Brexit and the effects of Brexit in the West Midlands. That's about average for the UK. So second to growth, 
We also really need to get serious about inequality. Good jobs have to be a goal for the next decade. We've seen worker power really pick up post-pandemic. We're seeing a lot of strikes at the moment, um, particularly by rail workers. And uh, worker power has been declining um, for the last several decades. It doesn't just affect pay, it also affects well-being. Um, the share of workers who are getting in-the-job training over the past decade has halved. So people aren't getting the benefits of having their uh, uh, of having work and power. It's also about work intensity. There used to be a stress premium, so if you're in a low, a low uh, wage job, you would have lower stress on average, whereas now that's increased. So the stress for workers in low wage jobs are very, relatively similar to workers in high wage jobs. We also need to focus on modern green jobs. Um, there's about 84% of tech, uh, the CCC thinks that by 2035 we need to implement all of the changes to net zero, we need 84% new technologies, and they're going to be developed over the next decade. So we really need those workers to be in places like Birmingham creating those three jobs. We've got to make sure um, that net zero, however, doesn't leave people behind. We have very leaky houses in the UK. Birmingham has very leaky houses, um, and more than half of the poorest households in the West Midlands leave, live in homes without wall insulation. But at the same time, it's very expensive. It costs about £9,000 to, to fully upgrade uh, your house. So if you're a low-income homeowner, that's going to be your entire annual income is going to be spent on upgrading your house. It's not realistic. Um, so how can we get people uh, insulating their homes and also affording it? How are we going to pay for, the, for these new exciting things like home insulation? Better taxes need to be the talk of the town. Um, you can see from this chart, uh, the red line shows um, the, the total net household wealth over the, since 1965, which has increased from 300% times of GDP to 800% of GDP. But you can see at the same time our wealth-related taxes have stayed about flat for the last uh, 50 years. Um, capital gains tax is taxed at lower rates than income tax, which has some very strange uh, distorted incentives. Um, and wealth tax typically don't harm growth. We also need to build security in the labour market. Uh, we ran some co uh, focus groups recently. This is a quote from one in co Coventry. Um, everything's going up. Do you risk going into a new job, a new probation period? I couldn't afford to lose my job right now, so you just stick with what you know. People don't switch jobs if they don't have unemployment insurance, and they aren't able to take the risk to do extra training, or uh, do a, go to a different type of job because they would risk losing their income because we have one of the lowest uh, net replacement rates uh, for unemployment in the EU, in uh, the OECD. So what's the price? Gains which can reshape our society. We've taken an average of five countries which are relatively like the UK. We haven't taken the US, which is on the frontier of productivity. We haven't taken Norway, which is on the frontier of inequality. We've looked at Australia, Canada, France, Germany, and the Netherlands, similar Anglo-Saxon and European countries that we're quite like. So what would happen if, uh, to our incomes, if you look at the left-hand side, the red bars show the poorer 20%, the green bars show the richer 20%, and the, the, again, the blue bars show kind of the middle 20% uh, of people. And so if we raised our income levels so we were the same as these comparators, our incomes across the board would go up by 20%. If we reduced inequality so we were the same in the, in the middle section, so that we were the same as these comparators, the, for the poorer people, their income would go up by 20%. The richer people, their incomes would go back down by 10%. But key, if you combine these two effects, if you reduce inequality and increase growth, you can see quite radical effects. Um, so, uh, you know, 45% uh, increase for the lowest 20% and uh, still an increase for the richest 20% in society. We need to use this current cost of living crisis to really think about these two decades of stagnation. Um, we can revitalise the UK economy, but we've got to build on our strengths in things like services, and we need to spread the gains across our regions with significant investment. But it also means ensuring change does not exacerbate our higher levels of inequality. 
The prize is potentially huge. So we're hoping that we can achieve it and enjoy the discussion today on how we're going to get there. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're going to hear from Deborah. Deborah Cameron, over to you. Thank you. Um, can you hear me without the um, microphone? No. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There you go. Um, so, so I've been asked to do three things in response. Um, you've, you've asked me to talk about what role can economic strategies play in responding to the challenges that we're seeing in the UK. How will the challenges, how will the changes come to affect the jobs we do, the places we live and the businesses we work for, and then finally what are the prospects of the country rising to these challenges. Now, for those of you that know me will know that I probably won't stick to those three, but in any <laughs> event, I will probably start with the third one, which is about, you know, it, it, it's a, a... So I'll start with Deloitte's recent crane survey, which is quite interesting, because the verdict on the city says that Birmingham is being transformed and the pace of change is relentless. Now, I agree with this sentiment, but I want to get beyond the cranes picture and unpick where we are. What are our challenges and where do we want to be? In short, I think we have amazing opportunities in the city, but we also have significant challenges. And I believe that bold city leadership will be essential for success. Now, I'm not just talking about bold leadership as Boeing City Council, although I, I would suggest we have a significant role to play. That's bold leadership across all sectors, and across all of the city. So I'm, I'm going to address the third question that you've asked me, and what are the prospects for success? Um, but also address the changes that come to affect the jobs we do, the places we live, and the organisations we work for. Now, we make this incredibly complicated, and I think it needs to be really simple. And I, and I kind of talk to my people who work in Birmingham City Council, and I remind them that the people who live and work here and invest here essentially want four things. And we should address you know, our response to that through four prisms. So how do people want to live? What kind of homes do they want to live in? What kind of homes do they deserve? How do people want to gain the skills and the jobs? How do they want to work? And then how do people travel? How do we connect them both in the city and around the city and outside the city, connecting them to the broader UK. And then fourthly, which is one I particularly love, is how do people love and connect into their place? And what I mean by that is what's their sense of, sense of connectedness? How do we feed their soul? How do we ensure that they gain you know, all the benefits of culture and sport and leisure and green, uh, a green environment? So I, I constantly challenge my organisation to, to view the world through those four prisons. So let me start with let me start with what are the prospects for success. And the answer, of course, is it depends. Uh, success depends on us being smart, determined, and I would argue bold. And those of you that know Birmingham will see our strap line needs to be bold, be Birmingham. But equally, we need to be intentional about our interventions. I'm an economist, but I don't believe in trickle down economics. Or I certainly don't believe that trickle-down economics will address the challenges we've got in Birmingham in the time scale that we need them, that we need them to. So if I take the example of the Commonwealth Games, the largest multi-sport uh, event held in England in 10 years, delivered in half the time that a host city normally has, under budget and during the COVID pandemic. We were extraordinary. We were absolutely extraordinary. But the challenge now is to make that extraordinary the new ordinary for this city. And it allowed us to showcase the city in a way that has raised our national and international standing. We are now viewed as a global city. So all of you that are responsible for other organisations and institutions and businesses, you know, we should be really applauding that. But equally, we should be taking advantage of the fact that Birmingham is now a global city. But it wasn't just about a one-off boost to the economy. It was also about building a significant legacy. And if you'll indulge me for a bit, I am going to share a quote which, which I've used ruthlessly since the Commonwealth Games. And it was written by a journalist that said, he said, how did the host city do brilliantly? 
At best, it felt like a glimpse of Britain as it ought to be in the 21st century. Open, busy, witty, creative, colourful, and multicultural. And I think that is a wonderful description of Birmingham and this place. And, and also, it set the scene for us being host to a number of other mass participation events. We've, we've just, I don't, know, I don't know whether we're privileged or happy to have landed the uh, European Athletics in 2026, because I'm now looking at how much that's going to cost, but it is in 2026, it'll be fine. <laughs> so the Commonwealth Games also kind of allowed us to start thinking about the next 10 years. And we talk about it as a golden decade of opportunity. And, the, and we should end up with high speed to arrival in the city. Now, what I, what I will say about that, and, it, and, and I make no judgment about whether this is the brilliant, you know, national investment programme in, you know, ever or not. I won't make a judgment about that. But what I will, would say is that well, there is a viewing platform, and, and, I've, and I've taken lots of senior civil servants and ministers and investors, and, I, and I've taken them on the viewing platform, and I said, this is the brilliant kind of investment that we're seeing across the city. And you can see on the horizon, you can see the cranes, and it really is fantastic. But then I, I turn them round to the blocks of flats you can see less than half a mile away that exist in one of the most deprived places in this city. And that encapsulates the challenge that we've got. Of course we can't, we don't want to put a break on the, you know, the economic investment and growth that we're seeing in the city, but we've got to make sure that that growth is the right growth. We've got to make sure that growth is inclusive and we've got to make sure that it helps us close that inequalities gap that we're seeing in Birmingham today. And I, I will start with an honest account of some of the inequalities that we're, we're experiencing. And even before COVID, we had over 300,000 residents in absolute poverty, which included 100,000 children. And a statistic that I, I use all the time is that a third of our children who are under four are not school ready at this moment in time. Now, for those of you that understand what that means, you will know that that is potentially a ticking time bomb. And it is not good enough that a third of our children will be disadvantaged, potentially disadvantaged throughout all of their education career, and then they will appear in the workplace unable to read, write, their social skills are, you know, uh, not, at a, not where we would want them to be. So, so we've got to be thoughtful and we've got to be intentional about the intervention that, that we make in, in that part of our, our, our communities. Also, high inflation is making all of this so much worse and, and it's created a genuine cost of living crisis for many of our, our residents. Now, the nation's experienced low unemployment, but in Birmingham, un unemployment is much higher. In numbers, the numbers of the last claim account in October of this year was 60,800. And also, alongside this high employment level, 30% of Birmingham's population is economically inactive. Again, storing up massive issues around their ability to contribute to economic growth. And, and I believe that the recession will make that worse. Again, if, if we do nothing, it will become even worse. So our intervention has to be intentional. So the other challenge that we've got is balancing the real urgency now with long-term long-term intervention. So we're taking immediate action on the cost of living. So we're increasing access to money advice because we know the most effective intervention we can make is about ensuring people have more money in their pockets. So we're investing a lot um, in increasing access to money advice and uh, accessing more benefits. We're opening warm welcome spaces across the city and we're increasing support for food banks and energy efficient measures. And, you know, trying to address the real urgency now with long-term intervention is not a zero-sum game. It can't be. But to address the longer-term impacts, we're now accelerating our work supporting more people into good employment, as well as advice and information. It is actually about giving people the opportunity to earn money and then recirculate it in the, in the economy. And that's about creating conditions for inclusive growth. So, as... Uh, so if I now talk about development in the longer, medium to longer term, as a city council we have a massive asset base and we're term, determined to get more public value from it. So if I say, you all, you'll all know that we're the largest council in Europe, but we also have the largest estate of any UK local authority. And we also, as a, 
as a corollary to that, have the largest development programme. But I am not allowed to use the asset base in a creative and different way. And I cannot tell you how much I hate the idea of constantly going to government asking them for more money. So we have three opportunities to get money in the city. One is the government settlement. Two is about raising money locally through council tax, through business rates. And then the third opportunity is around attracting investment, either domestically or globally. Now, I would much rather use the assets we've got in a creative way to put on, on the table as leverage to attract inward investment into the city. So we're, we're having interesting conversations with the Treasury at the moment about how we can do that and, and lessen our ask of the public purse. Now you'll see, as for those of you that, that live in the city or have walked up from the station, you'll see it's really vibrant. You know, we've got large financial institutions who have made this home to their headquarters. PwC, Goldman Sachs, HSB next door, Deutsche Bank, they've all set up shop here, which is phenomenal. But we've got to use our sites and this interest and this investment to underpin the future economy we want to secure. Now, partly this is about housing and creating places where people want to live. We are super diverse, and the ONS statistics this week have now uh, stated that 51% of our population are, for black and are from black and minority ethnic communities. And we're really proud of the fact that we're one of the most diverse cities in the UK, and you could argue in, in Europe. And we have an exceptionally youthful population of 1.15 million. So we expect our population to grow by 150,000 by 2031. So we know that homes will have, and we also know that homes have become ever less affordable relative to earnings. So we've got a problem here. You know, we've got more, more people. Uh, we've got the population is growing. We don't have houses that are fit for purpose in large swathes of our estates that we have. And we also know that there will be more and more demand, demand for, for affordable housing. Our bed and breakfast numbers are increasing phenomenally alongside our homelessness numbers. So we've got to be more intentional in the way in which we create the conditions to grow and build more affordable housing. So we're also thinking in a very clear way about sources of good jobs. Now, we've got a real strong pedigree of making things with a city of a thousand trades, and we're really proud of that. But we can't be unrealistic about the role, the future role of manufacturing. And, and Torsten Bell came to talk to us and gave us a good telling off, actually, when he came to talk to us um, about, you know, you've just got to let go of this, this history of manufacturing and see that as the future, because it isn't. So we've got to be different about that. We want to move up the value chain. We want to develop new opportunities such as low carbon technologies, harnessing regional expertise in hydrogen, a very light railway to support the transition to net zero. Birmingham, Coventry and Wolverhampton have come together as three cities. Between us, we have 165,000 social homes to retrofit. Now, if that isn't a market disruptor, I don't know what is. So we're really excited about the potential of that, of developing the skills base, of developing the manufacturing base, of developing a new domestic and international supply chain, of attracting significant investment into this city and into this region. But interestingly, our largest sector is in fact health, and it employs 91,000 people. We have real strengths here. We have 500 life science firms, world-leading research institutions, the world's largest creation of clinical trial activity for drugs and medical devices. And the QE Hospital has the largest critical care unit in Europe and is the National Centre for Trauma, Trauma and Defence Medicine. And construction is now underway on the health innovation campus in the city. But we also need to grow our role in professional services, finance, digital and design. And that means creating the physical and business environment that those firms need for success. We're also really proud to be the home of um, the BBC and their regional headquarters and the film sector is growing with independent studios as well in the area of Digbeth. You know, and we're really, really excited about what that can mean in supporting the UK's second largest concentration of the games industry, 
where we have 130 fir firms and a quarter of games produced in the UK are produced in the West Midlands. So to grow our economy, attract business and private sector investment, improve productivity, we require better connectivity. And that's about metro, it's about buses, it's about general mobility. And it's good to have such a, a you know, great national international, and international connections. But actually, right now, the transport options within our city are often pretty poor, and especially in areas like East Birmingham. And what we want is the freedom from government to invest in and grow our connectivity. And we've developed a detailed plan for that focused on East Birmingham. And for those of you that know East Birmingham will know that that is the area from the first high speed st to station in the international international station all the way through to uh, Curzon Street. So that is going to be a really, really important part of the city for us to both foster and grow, but also to support and enable those residents that are in that part of the city as they see that high-speed train cut through their communities, know and feel that they have every right to, to capture the opportunities that are coming out of that university. So we also, we also need to enhance our workforce as well. And Emily spoke about graduates and the need to keep our graduates safe. And I've got two of my graduate trainees sitting over there, and I'm really proud to have them here with us today. And we really, we really, really value um, the, the role of graduates, people choosing to stay in the city once they've graduated from our institutions. We've got five degree awarding institutions, and of those 80,000 graduates in the city, we want to keep at least 39%. So it really is about Birmingham being a place where graduates want to live, have a career, and often to have a family and bring up their family. So we're very mindful of that. It can't just be about here's a job. It's also got to be about house. It's got to be about the environment. It's got to be about feeding their soul. So finally, uh, and I will, and I, I'm conscious that I've gone on a bit, but um, we did launch our Birmingham City Observatory with uh, the University of Birmingham and, and many of you here today. It's on online, freely accessible, and it's a collaborative data platform. And it will publish city data and insight, and, and that will also include um, data and insight for the private sector. We want to draw in more par partners to obtain, use, and publish the best economic analysis in the country. And by doing that, we'll better understand our city, we'll be able to predict the future. Well, that's quite a piece. <laughs> but I believe it will enable us to understand what the future will look like. We'll marshal our resources, target interventions, but more importantly, it will drive the interventions with intent that we need to make. So I'll draw things to a close now, David, if I may. But I did, I did want to say we are ambitious and we're also bold, but we're also very clear about the responsibility of shaping Birmingham and its economy in an intentional and responsible way. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Henrietta Rantelau from the left, over to you. Thank you. I'm uh, also seeing if you can hear me without the microphone. Um, but when I stand here, then uh, you certainly will be able to hear me. Yeah. I thought it might it's, the on, it's also for the online participants, so if you were a tiny bit closer, that helps with that. Yeah. Um, uh, unlike Birmingham City Council, the local enterprise partnership might not be as well known an entity to all of you in the room. So I'm, uh, well, I've had a thumbs up here from those of you who are online watching this. Uh, so I thought it might just help. Uh, before I go on to answer the three questions that, that you, you posed and said that uh, Deborah's gone into as well, just to say a few words about um, the local enterprise partnership and particularly about the Great Birmingham and Solihull local enterprise partnership that I am proud to be the chief executive of. Local enterprise partnerships were established in 2011 after the regional development agencies had uh, been abolished and they uh, were set up to drive inclusive and sustainable economic growth, which is exactly what they've done, and they were set up to do that at a uh, sub-regional level. 
and by bringing together the triple helix of uh, the business community, private sector, with private sector led, but also very much involve the local authorities, higher and further education institutions in the area. Um, and um, at the time, we also wrote a uh, strategic economic plan that governed the, the uh, period or covered the period 2016 to 2030. Um, Although I think it is now gathering a bit of dust on a, quite a, a few shelves, and I, and I want to come back on that on, on that point. So just want to give you a quick flavour in that decade or so that, that the left has been going as to what it's it's done to drive that inclusive, sustainable growth. So um, a lot of the capital investments that Deborah talked about, a lot of the fantastic things you will have seen on your way from New Street Station or wherever you've come from here have had uh, a bit of um, uh, GDSF involvement. Whether that's in Team Reed Square, whether that's a new front of the repertory theatre, the Symphony Hall, whether that's Cornwall Road, the magnificent Brown Hotel, but also whether that's East Birmingham and Fizey Energy Park, for example, or indeed the Health Innovation Council. Um, over that decade, we um, uh, attracted over 800 million government funding, and uh, we also managed the enterprise zone on behalf of the City Council. So, so lots of money attracted. We've made that money work hard, and um, in in the last five or so years, we've increasingly made that public money work in a way that means we can recycle and use it again. So a lot of the grants we've uh, awarded now include payback clauses, which means when the grant has done what it was supposed to do and it starts to generate a profit for the recipient, the recipient can, can start paying it back. So it re-enters the public purse and we can reinvest it in, and get it to work hard again. And I, I, and I want to highlight that because that's a lesson we learned that we've become really rather good at but um, only in the last five years or so. Another strand of what we do is business support. In the last year alone, we supported over 1,750 local SMEs. Um, we do things like help them secure access to finance. We run leadership programs. We do general diagnostics to help businesses understand what it is they might need to grow and prosper. We do training needs analysis to, to understand where workforce development uh, might need to happen. And right now, we help businesses with the rising cost of energy. And we run what's called a Clean Growth Grant program, where we uh, set aside one million pounds to uh, uh, award businesses grants of up to 10,000 pounds to help invest in energy re reducing measures. And um, I can tell you all, if you, you haven't changed all your lighting in your house yet for LED lighting, do it promptly, because when looking at return on investment, that is by far the most impactful, quick return on investment you can secure. And that's certainly what we're doing with a lot of businesses and, and, and really helping them do something quick because we know after they got through Brexit and they got through the pandemic, there's a lot of businesses in this area that are just feeling like this could be one crisis too far for them. We also work on skills for employment, and it's not just skills and employment, it's really focusing on those higher level skills where we've still got a deficit compared with the UK average, um, but also those skills that then create the higher level good quality jobs that we need our people to, to have in, in, the, in this local area to make sure the quality of life is driven up uh, upwards as well. Really focus on apprenticeships, because from our perspective, apprenticeships can be such a tremendous route into employment for a lot of uh, people, and it's still very un unjustly seen by many as a, as a second option, something you do if you can't get into university, or something as an employee you do if you can't recruit people the conventional way, uh, when apprenticeships actually can be so uh, valuable as well in terms of tailoring and getting the most out of people who maybe aren't as um, academically inclined or as theoretically and intellectually inclined as some, but who might have fantastic visual, creative, practical um, abilities to, to exploit. And that's part of our commitment really to uh, young, the younger people of this city region as well, because there's been an abundance of evidence to show that the pandemic 
has disproportionately affected younger people and even more so younger people who were, were already facing challenges before the pandemic. Um, we manage Birmingham City Council's apprenticeship levy and we use that unspent levy to, to support businesses and local people. Um, and, and we um, create those apprenticeships and opportunities for younger people, not just through money, because our pockets aren't as deep as they once were, but also by being an enabler and getting people in the same room and, and looking where, where are there areas that we can work together and, uh, and make the, the whole more than the sum of the parts. And um, before I move on to answering the questions, uh, after all that, I do need to uh, tell you that LEPs are now integrating, that the leveling up white paper has, has decided uh, log long enterprise partnerships will integrate in their local democratically elected institutions. And in the case of the LEPs, the three LEPs in this part of the world, the Black Country LEP, the Common Free Warwickshire LEP, and the Great Birmingham and Solomon LEP, that means integrating into the West Midlands Combined Authority. Uh, so what we're really focused on focusing on now is to make sure that our functions, and it's always been clear to us, form follows function. It's definitely not about form, but it is about the functions being transferred in a way that protects all that learning that's been happening over um, a decade or, or more. So the first question we were asked to focus on is what role can economic strategies, national and local, play in responding to challenges of the 2020s to secure higher growth and lower inequality. Now, Emily and, and Deborah was said so much already, so I'm just going to pick out uh, five elements that I think economic strategies have to have in order to be um, uh, effective in responding to challenges. They are prerequisites, if you like. The first is that those strategies are there for the longer term and that there's a consistency of purpose and a continuity of purpose. And um, I think that's really important and it does feel at the moment that we're chasing the flavour of the month and that we put a hell of a lot of resources and getting our heads around the terminology and, and the, the requirements of that flavour of the month and then there's yet another strategy uh, to focus on. And um, I have a background, much like Deborah, in the Regional Development Agency and I remember when they closed, and it took a while for the lefts to find their feet, and there was a vacuum for, for probably about two years where businesses didn't quite like, know where to go for their business support, and, then, and it, it took a while to get going. And then lefts, and, and uh, my opinion was when the IDAs closed down, that it was just at the point when they were getting really rather good at what they were doing. And it feels like we're repeating that a little, little bit with the, with the LEPs as well. And the important thing is now we definitely can't um, afford a vacuum and a hiatus of, of functions. And we need to make sure businesses have that continuity of place where they can find the services they, they know and, and trust. So I think really important strategies are there for the longer term. Strategies need to be supported with funding, whether that's fiscal incentives or, or in fact, whether it's regulatory reform, a strategy that hasn't got a carrot and a stick attached. It's just good words that probably make a lot of sense, but it does need that to, to make things happen. They need to be evidence-based, and I think it's great Deborah mentioned the observatory. I, I think in so many other ways we are in uncharted territory. One of our uh, board members is um, uh, 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 from the, the world of banking and finance and he said in, in his company they now uh, have webinars with colleagues from Argentina because um, they've got all the knowledge on how to operate in a double digit inflation economy. Uh, that's the kind of, we are in uncharted territory so we need to base ourselves on evidence and we can't afford to think We've always done it this way, so surely it will, uh, it, it will, uh, um, uh, if we do more of the same, it will ch achieve what we want to achieve. Needs to be uh, holistic. Uh, we need to recognize that you can't look at the economy and productivity in isolation without realizing the direct impact of uh, health, of, of early childhood um, uh, uh, development of 
of child poverty, of fuel poverty, of uh, skills. There needs to be a holistic strategy and um, it needs to involve that triple helix or even quadruple helix and it's really important strategies aren't developed in isolation and actually have input from the very people who should benefit from them and maybe in the first instance have in input from the people who currently feel they are not benefiting and, and they're left behind and that might make for some quite challenging and difficult listening but there are people in this magnificent city that haven't benefited from the Commonwealth Games and that barely, were barely aware the Commonwealth Games were on and as someone who couldn't wipe the smile off their face for, for the whole period of the Commonwealth Games, I'd say to people, isn't it fantastic? And you do find that there are people who, who think, what, I live a mile away, but it's passed me by. Um, so from my perspective, those are the five things that any strategy should, should have to be effective, and I don't think that's necessarily what's, what, what's always happening at the moment. But the second question was how the changes to come will affect the jobs we do, the places we live and the businesses we work for, which is such a broad question that it's almost impossible to answer. But um, the two things that jump out to me are climate adaptation and climate change. It's, it's accelerating. If Vancouver can have heat waves that the fact, um, uh, melts the tarmac, if uh, Germany can have their their infrastructure wiped away by mudslides, we'd be really, really naive to think we are not going to face climate disasters at some point and that we shouldn't be prepared for those climate disasters. And I think that will really affect the way we we probably all are suddenly aware of our smart meter already just by what's happening to the energy um, uh, prices. I think it will really um, continue to change the way we, we live and work. Um, and it's more than a net zero, it's really about adapting to the climate change that's already happening and the jobs that that will bring with it and potentially the uh, opportunity to uh, reduce inequalities uh, could, could be something this region really could, could uh, grab with both hands and I think ties the energy park is a really, really excellent example of something that could roll out further. Uh, and then the other thing uh, that I can see in the future is a different approach to work. We've got this weird labour market disconnect at the moment with large numbers of the unfilled vacancies coexisting with really stubborn economic inactivity and high unemployment. So that something's got to change in the way we approach the world of work and we've got to make work pay for people. There are so, too many people who would really want to work, but the cost and the risk attached of, of starting a job um, or move, Emily talked about moving to a new job, but it's not just moving to a new job, it can be starting a job. I was talking to someone the other day who said a young person who could, um, uh, who was offered the opportunity to get a job that would pay £27,000, a good job, said, I can't do that because I still live with my mum and dad and if I start earning that money, their benefits will be at risk and I can't do that to them. There's, there's something in the system that makes it very difficult for, for people to, to uh, make work pay for them. And then the final question is, what are the prospects of this country rising to these challenges? And I don't particularly want to talk about this country. I think it's really about this city region and the de devolution. This should be about this city region. We can't afford to not rise to the challenge. I've got so much confidence that we will, as anyone who has been around these streets during the Commonwealth Games has seen the best of our, our spirit in play. We, we've got the graduates, we've got the inherent strength of a really diverse and very young population and I think a young population will be a, a competitive advantage at the time of climate change because the young population will inevitably think further ahead then someone in their 20s thinks with a longer horizon than someone in their 50s or 60s. And I think the, the, the um, trick will be to engage the young people, to get them to be as excited and feel part of the golden decade of opportunity as they should um, feel. And I think with that being the case, like not rising to the challenge is simply not an option. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um.
we are unfortunately now a little bit tight for time. We're going to collect some interventions quickly, and if you could give your name and organisation, that'd be fantastic. I'm mean, particularly interested in policy ideas and things you would do. Yeah, and of course, David, I'm happy to do that. My name is Andrew, Andrew Edwards. Uh, I come on the train today, although I work in Birmingham, I live in London, and even though Wales and England are playing, I'm still happy to be here. I want to know that. So, my observation about what are you not doing and what have you not mentioned during your conversation? I was at the CPI last week at their conference, at the Tory party conference, all held just here uh, at the absolute case, and it was at the Commonwealth Games and, 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 as well. Make this compare When I got off the train at Blackpool, the Tory party conference in Blackpool, the first thing they gave was a welcome to Blackpool pack to tell you how good Blackpool was. And that's what should happen, right? You've got a fantastic airport alone, right? A fantastic airport, Deborah. And you have a permanent base there that says, welcome to Birmingham. Because that is where you get the contact in, you get your details in and everything like that. And then finally, you've got the trains, children trains come through Solid Hole, right? And under promoted routes into Birmingham, you've got Transport for Wales come into New Street. Absolutely brilliant. Don't wait for HS2. You have got a great cross country railway network here. And then my final point is I work for the Housing Association is tackle the empty homes. Birmingham has got loads of empty homes that can be filled that make the economy stronger and greater. I want you to know it's been a pleasure to be here and listen to all four of you chat. Thank you so much. That was excellent. But when I was a boy, one of my treats was to be taken to the airport to look at the planes. Which does not age me, but there we are. Right, next intervention. And uh, um, John McDonough from Recrawl Consulting, which is an employer in the recruitment solutions business. I was at the launch of this on a very hot day in Westminster. And what often happens, including the CPI conferences, is people don't answer my question. And that's not because of being awkward, but as was explained after that last one, people don't understand the seriousness of what I am raising. Intent, I love it, one of my favourite words. I've been trying to shift the intent in this city for more than a decade. And it doesn't move. The employability and skills system is broken. And it's broken. And it's been broken for years. And nobody wants it. And nobody really wants to do anything about it. And I could sit here all week and list what's going on with that across the country. It's not specific up here. Nobody wanted. And I think the shift that we need to borrow a metaphor that will be coming from the football, because this is a sacrifice to miss this, but we appreciate that. We've got to start putting some challenges in. Right? We've got to start standing up. We've, we've backed off the opposition to call them that by right? all departments, for example, for too long. I sat through a lot of engagement event with DWP this morning. It was excruciating. They've got no idea. So Very specific more. thing would you like to see to change? Yes, yes. Like, give us one practical thing. First, first thing, here it is. So, and this is not a position for work, but the, the data that data you pay have will show that when we run programs up here to get people into work, we are the most effective in the country. Why are we not part of the furniture here? And the reason why is, um, that's right, they haven't got one, but it's their process or it's equal opportunities, etc. It's shifting their intent because is every job and every job seeker entitled to the best possible support or not? And if they are, and I suggest they should be, everything else then has to work backwards from that. And then you're going to cultural change in organisations such as DWP. Colleges, universities, training providers, charities, the whole, the whole landscape. And that's the entry point, I think. Right, we've got a skills challenge. And uh, let's take a, a two more interventions here. Let's keep on going. Thank you. Uh, I loved, I loved this presentation. It's quite interesting, you did. Um, thank you for working with um, Going to one of the areas you talked about, which is housing. Uh, and the environmental challenge we have. Like. I, I love the report. Uh, first thing that has been 9,800 to get houses special built uh, up to these standards. I think that figure needs to be worked on a little bit. Um, if we get some more, that's fine. Um, 
but actually, it is very cheap investment. And I, I was thinking, what else would you buy for nine thousand eight hundred? You could go and buy a second hand car. You know, um, you pay that off in three years. You don't even think about it. Even the people who own limited can do that. And right here, we've got this magnificent target. You can register it very quickly. It's not that expensive, but it's how we pay for it. And it is a great day. I love that word recycling. Get the money out there, get it back in, get it out there. I think, you know, if, that, if that's pushed this more in this strategy, that would be great. Right, and then hand the microphone across. No intention, yep. Hi, I'm Carice from WSP. Um, I think mine's more of an observation rather than an intervention. Um, and it's really echoing my, uh, what's the name? New friend. New friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is around um, Birmingham's and West Midlands kind of advertising um, aspect. I think um, Birmingham far too often compares itself to London. I think it needs to concentrate on itself um, as a, an amazing city. Um, and think about its USPs um, because I don't think it needs to compare itself to London. It has its own, you know, um, great um, um, areas that it uh, selling points really. And um, so yeah, I think that's all I have to say with regards to that. It's a very interesting point. I very much agree with you about USPs, and uh, I think Birmingham has got a charm and it, the, the sense of humour, down to earth, distinctive. <laughs> Um, if I were to just draw on what's already been said about some of the USPs, um, I was thinking uh, that first of all, historically, uh, Birmingham was a kind of crossroads. It was a junction. It isn't here because there's a port or even because there's a cotton field. It's here because lots of different routes, canals, and roads intersected. And that is still relevant today with HS2. Um, and it does mean that there's a distribution and transport hub as an opportunity. I think what, uh, I think this whole issue that Deborah raised of being minority majority, now officially in the statistics out today, and youthful, uh, is distinctive. Uh, one of the reasons why it's a great place for uh, medical trials is that often drug companies are looking for an ethnically diverse group of people on whom to test a drug. Actually, being ethnically diverse is a massive advantage attracting um, some types of business and for medicine and medical research it's incredibly important it's a good base for being global in life sciences and then the university has got one of the world's best historic databases it's been it's been teaching the hospital for so long it's got you know cancer tissue going back to the 1930s it's got some amazing health research uh, uh, resources tied in with being so useful um, I think that energy and uh, that what's going on at hy hydrogen, and I don't know the tiny energy part, but um, Birmingham has got it. After all, the gallery, the art gallery is in Gas Street and was financed partly by funding from the municipal town gas company. Um, and for Birmingham, I think, to be a leader in hydrogen which is one of the areas of applied research where it's leading. And thinking about infrastructure, you need to function hydrogen. With hydrogen, I think would be really exciting. Um, and I think for economic activity and inactivity, there are some very distinct cultural challenges. And showing that Birmingham, going back to your point, sir, on skills, that some of the areas where, let's face it, um, for culture and other reasons, some groups that have particularly high rates of economic inactivity. Showing that Birmingham can understand that and in a uh, sensitive way tackle it, I think would be something the rest of the country and other countries could learn from helping Muslim women to work, for example. So I think, um, I think the sense of a young, dynamic, open-minded and diverse city trying to take account of its USP and doing things with that is very exciting. Um, other interventions and... Yes, gentlemen here. Yeah. Hiya. Um, Joe Gayton from the Lunar Society. Um, I wanted to pick up on 
an interim report which, which goes very hard on the national strategy being about the tradable services, perhaps at the expense of manufacturing. And I've heard now from Deborah, you had a telling off from, uh, from the think tank uh, about too much manufacturing. Uh, but from living in Birmingham for a year now, I've, I've learned it's a very spaced out place and you know, you've probably got plenty of room in the centre for services to really expand and multiply. Uh, but, but those manufacturing jobs out on the periphery could be a good way of getting people into work. And, and my challenge, I suppose, is can't it be both and don't we need a lot more manufacturing for our net zero obligation anyway? And uh, can, can, can't we have both? That's a very fair challenge, and uh, yeah, that's very, and Emily was very diplomatic there, because if you think about comparative advantage, if Birmingham's GDP is 15% manufacturing against 10% of the country's whole, you can interpret that two ways. There's Torsten's interpretation, which is we've got to get strong in services. The other one, I think, argument might be Birmingham has a USP in manufacturing. Speaking of coming from a family of large numbers of Birmingham artisans and Crafts and silversmiths and power makers. We used to love all those trains. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentations. I'm representing the Federation of Small Businesses, and one of the most important things for us is to create the creativity for our young people to drive their own businesses, get their own ideas, but also to have the places where they can run their businesses. Most businesses, small businesses at the moment, are still home based and they need support, but we need those businesses to grow. And there are very few places where people can get affordable business premises for either services or for small manufacturing. And that's the real big focus because if they've got places to grow their business and it's not out of, the, out of their pocket, then they can grow their services because the creativity is there and the desire is there, we just haven't got the infrastructure to help that. Right, very interesting point. Thank you on that for Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm afraid I'm a journalist. I work for a magazine called Financial World. I wanted to ask a little bit about apprenticeships and your point about investing in, in doing up your home. One of the reasons I look at it and think, oh no, is because I'm worried that I cowboy will come along in and trash the place. Um, could there be apprenticeships and train people to be really excellent at building perceived houses, at creating people's homes, show them create lots of jobs and people then could feel secure about investing that money? Right, yes, and there's a big debate behind all that on license to practice and what that would mean. I mean so we're going to talk about panelists at the end. But just to see if there's any more interventions and suggestions, the gentleman there again. Sorry, David, just to come back on the point that you made about Muslim women, for example, we ran two programmes specifically for them with Jess Phillips and David European Yardley. Went fantastically well. And what happened since? And the, the, this was in the second phase of the report, and basically it got doctored. And it wasn't exactly honest. Now, when you've got an organisation, that's behaving like that. They're, not only are they not looking for a solution, they are purposely holding people and keeping them tight. And that's the extent to things that need to be addressed. And uh, look, there's experts in that area. I don't think that's a big part. I think there are large numbers of well intentioned organisations doing their best in tough circumstances. And we're here from the Resolution Foundation to hear from them. So I, I think. I think we work, we work on the basis of assuming goodwill and commitment to Birmingham, and we want to learn from that. Gentlemen here. Hi, I'm Carl Harris from Psychologists Against Austerity. Um, I, I thought the, the presentations covered just about all of the bases you'd want to cover, but I think it was injury time in the first half before climate change got its foot on the ball. Um, so we've heard about the vision, we've got an idea of the number of good people in this, in this city who potentially have that as one of their imperatives for the kind of world they want to live in, the place they want to be, the kind of jobs they want to do. And I'm assuming that we've got a very good representation of the people who actually could help to make that vision a reality. Um, but my question is, are we looking through the right lens? Have we got the right economic model to actually address these concerns? Right, we've certainly got a green 
climate challenge and we need to reshape the economy to respond to it. Any other intervention before I turn to our panellists to sum up? Any other personal suggestions or observations for us as we move on to the next stage of our report? We've got, um, we've got a classic kind of agenda, it's very useful. Um, got to talk about, yes, lady that. I thought if I kept whispering on, we'd get another intervention. Thank yes. you so much. Sorry, I'm Anne Green from the University of Birmingham. Um, I've appreciated very much what you've had to say today. You've said a lot about young people, and I think they're very important. But also, Birmingham has people who aren't young people, and let's remember them as well. And also, I think there's something about if people are born today, they might live for 100 years. So let's think about these things, as you've said, in the long term through that life course perspective and think about jobs and skills in that perspective as well. So it's not just about apprenticeships as you start off, but let's think about how we attacked through time and through that 100 years. So there's a lot of people here that's really only, only in the first half. There's a lot of people here who are in the second half and have a lot of that second half still to go. So let's think about it in a life course perspective as well. Right. But thank you very much, everyone. No, thank you. That's a good reminder. Well, I'm going to, going to turn to our panellists just for their final observations. Let's, let's take the reverse order. Anyways, do you want to set the ball up? Yes, uh, and, and some really good uh, points made. I want to start by saying I'm an adopted brony and I couldn't be prouder to be an adopted brony and I think one of the beautiful things about Birmingham is uh, while some places feel like you have to earn the right to call yourself a local in, in Birmingham the welcoming culture is such that if you feel like you belong you definitely made to feel like, well, we're really glad you want to belong here. And that's a fantastic culture to, to have. And um, I'm from the Netherlands originally, so I'm one of those five countries that looks so really good compared to, to the UK on your side. Um, and I, I couldn't be prouder to choose to, to be in this part of the world. And I think we, we do knock ourselves unnecessarily sometimes in, in the rest of the world. So I want, to, I want to just put that out there. And then I wanted to say one thing in response to the point about apprentices and the importance of maybe apprentices in the area of, of retrofit and those, the, the kind of all, all the work that is needed on housing. And I think the work that Birmingham are doing in East Birmingham with the retrofit um, uh, uh, plans of, of social housing creates demand that's really needed to enable training providers to then train up the apprentices and put on the courses because in the absence of um, regulation and, and legislation around retrofit, you need to create that demand, otherwise you're training up people and there isn't a job at the end of it. And um, apprentices can be any age as well. And uh, so it's definitely not just for, for uh, young people. Thank you, Deborah. Um, thank you. There, there are lots here that I want to respond to, but I, I'll try and be focused. Um, I, I, I think you're right. The, the, the tourism offer in Birmingham is rubbish. You know, it was brilliant during the Commonwealth Games, and we mystically thought, you know, everyone knew where Birmingham was. So, so you're absolutely right. And um, uh, to just say that, that we use in the power of volunteers, there's brilliant people that welcomed everyone into the city, so you will see them again. But you're absolutely right. Um, climate change, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really disappointed that I didn't take the opportunity to convince you that we are absolutely looking through the way in which we develop and grow our economy through that lens. It's, it's absolutely vital. And, um, and when I spoke about retrofitting of our homes, the biggest these, I wouldn't say arguments, because I, I like to have a discussion and debate with more than one but, but the debate is, is, is around 65,000 homes that we're responsible for. You know, can we afford to do it? My response is, can we afford not to? When you look at the contribution to CO2 emissions coming predominantly from, from uh, our homes that we have in, in the city. Um, we've got a clear note that I think that needs to be far more vigorous than it is. 
previously understood or, or we needed to. So, so there's a, a different conversation to be had with this with the residents and businesses in the city about is this the right solution? Should we go with modern and faster uh, you know, stopping cars coming into and uh, into and across the city? And then we have you know an understood climate emergency, and we have the target of achieving net zero by 2030. Now that's really ambitious, and whether we achieve it or not is almost irrelevant. What, what we've done is give ourselves a target, so we have to put in place things now in order to have any kind of achieving achieving that target. But, but and I'm sorry you didn't hear that, but but absolutely we are committed to addressing and mitigating the impacts of climate change on this. And, and, and let's not forget the, you know, the power of green. You know, so we are investing you know, huge amounts of money in greening this, this city and open spaces, and we are using our planning powers to be far more intentional about the types of houses, you know, uh, access to electric charging points, but more importantly, being absolutely clear about people not building on the drums. So, so there are certain minimum sense we do. But it's not enough, and I do, do accept that, but we are being intentional about that. And don't compare yourself to London, I don't. Absolutely don't. We, we're different, and we would never be London, and, and I don't think we should try to aspire to be like London. But, but, but we do need to work with London. When you think that you can get on a train, you will be able to get on a train in London and arrive in London. 45 minutes. That's zone five, isn't it? You know, if you're so, so we've got, we've got to be thoughtful about what that means to both of our economies, really. And it doesn't need to be a zero sum game. You know, you win, we lose. So, so we're such an intention in the kind of conversations we have with our colleagues in London as well. So, I'll thank you very much. Yes, Emily. So, I'll try and cover up a couple of the questions um, that haven't been. Covered off. I guess. Well, first up on the on the point on kind of climate change more broadly. Um, obviously, the fact that gas prices, European gas prices, have gone up nine times right now. If we didn't rely on gas for our heating and for our electricity, then it wouldn't be hurting so hard. So it's it's a really core economic problem that we are facing, and it's kind of feeding through on a lot of um, the work that that kind of focus and analysis that people are doing, and I think has been a really important um, part of the, of the cost of living crisis at the moment. Um, in terms of the insulation um, points, which I think were really interesting as well, um, thinking about um, building up uh, why people aren't actually insulating their homes, and a lot of the reasons that, that you mentioned are in fact that people don't know what to do. Um, people don't know how to do their walls or their ceilings or you know, uh, it is, there is a, an information barrier that exists, and, and that's often a key reason rather than um, necessarily the cost. But for some people, the cost is really important, and we can't forget that. So we can't expect people who have incomes that cost the same amount as insulating a whole house to be paying for that. But we can expect rich people to be paying for insulation. So thinking about smart policy ideas, not to plug the paper, but we do have one coming out in a couple of weeks um, on insulation that's going to look at policy ideas around it. Um, in terms of the manufacturing uh, question as well, which I think is really interesting, you related it to employment levels, and even though um, Birmingham has 15% of its uh, output in terms of manufacturing, actually only 10% of employment is in manufacturing. So you actually have kind of lower levels of employment in manufacturing than the output. That said, manufacturing is still key to the Birmingham economy, and there are real comparative advantages that Birmingham has sustained, and things like gaming, um, which I've uh, discussed, are obviously key. And I will leave it there. Well, thank you very much, and uh, look, it's been a really interesting session. Uh, you haven't missed anything at half time, it's nil nil. Uh, <laughs> so, this was the, you definitely made the right decision. Um, so, uh, and it, it's given us uh, a lot of food for thought. Uh, we've got to go back and have our internal debates within uh, resolution about manufacturing being an example of comparative advantage or being a retro of activity, and you should be more about leads. Um, we've got a sense of Birmingham having a young and diverse population, and that being actually a fantastic opportunity for this city. Um, 
and uh, also the excitement of the, the further investment in transport and the powerful messages about energy and the green challenge. So thank you all very much indeed. Particular thanks to our panellists and thanks for the obvious commitment that everyone here has to uh, further investing in supporting and boosting the performance of Birmingham and the economy. Thank you very much.